So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, today we have Kevin Bradley. Uh, Kevin Bradley is a professor and state extension weed scientist in the Division of Plant Sciences and Technology at the University of Missouri. Um, since his arrival at the University of Missouri in 2003, most of Kevin's research and extension efforts have been focused on the development of integrated programs for the prevention and management of herbicide resistance in weeds, specifically water hemp. Um, so in this presentation today, Dr. Bradley will discuss the results from several studies that, that have examined the residual effects of common corn and soybean herbicides on successful cover crop establishment. Um, so with that being said, Kevin, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you and um, let you get started. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, yes. Yeah, so, you know, this topic, I think I can give you some uh, pretty easy takeaways right off the bat. Um, but uh, having said that, I, I will say that um, uh at least in Missouri and, and not all of Missouri, but in certain parts of this state right now, we're, we're setting up to uh, have the conditions that certainly could be uh, huge for carryover uh, uh, next year. Uh, so we'll just see what the weather brings, obviously. But, um, but yeah, just the drought that we're experiencing and the dry weather and uh, you know, it, it is, it was a problem last year and it's probably going to be one this year. So what Brent asked me to talk about is some of our work on herbicide carryover. We did it quite a few years back, uh, still relevant, but we did it quite a year, few years back. And so I'm going to tell you what we've done, but then at the end, I'm going to show you what some others have done since, since our trials, um, just kind of some results within the weed science literature. And I think it's, uh, pretty consistent throughout. Uh, and uh, so what we try to do, uh, this is a lot, I, I understand, but rather than show you a bunch of graphs, uh, data, bars and everything, uh, we did a trial for three years. Um, and uh, this trial uh, was done the same way every year. And we just took whatever weather conditions we got, whether we got a, a wet year or dry year or whatever. And so I think it kind of helps to see variability uh, because one of my take home messages is it's all about the moisture. Uh, it's, it's also about the time that you apply herbicide as far as how close to the cover crop planting. Um, and it's also about the active ingredient um, so those would be the three things that I'd say that, that matter. And if you don't take anything else away, you know, the active ingredient matters, which one we have a few ones that I'm going to give you red flags on the, the time that you, to spray it, for example, if it's just a pre corn or soybean herbicide, uh, those probably aren't as big of a concern as, a late later season post-emergence uh, overlapping residual or something like that. Um, uh, but there are certain active ingredients that um, certainly we'll point out and certain timelines that are more of at risk. And then, like I said, the third thing is just kind of, in most cases, nothing we can do about it uh, unless you're in irrig irrigated ground. And that is uh, just how much moisture we get. And so for uh, three years in a row, we did this trial and some of the uh, red flags, if you will, that came up uh, are shown here. And so Bamisafin, which is in Flexstar, it's in Reflex, it's in a lot of other products, uh, but probably everybody here hopefully knows it as Flexstar. Bamisafin is a product that ha should have a little bit of a uh, caution warning for you. It can, uh, it is more likely to carry over and, and hurt some of our uh, mostly broadleaf cover crops. Um, Imazethapir certainly can hurt tillage radish or forage radishes, but uh, Pursuit is Imazethapir. It's in a lot of other things, uh, but we don't use perhaps as much of that as we do of Amisafin. And so any product like a prefix 
So things like that that you see that active ingredient in would be one that is kind of a watch out. You notice on here, uh, not a whole lot of problems with the cereal grass crops. We, we evaluated uh, winter oat, cereal rye, and winter wheat. And there was some years where we had one, uh, some, some biomass reduction, um, but uh, for the most part, um, they're, they're pretty resilient and uh, there's not as much problem there with uh, the cereal grasses as there are the broadleaf crops. And I'll just say that probably the most sensitive crop uh, is, is, the, is the radishes, the forage and tillage radish. Uh, of anything that we've looked at. Certainly, um, crimson clover might might come in close to that. But so those are the soybean treatments. And so uh, uh, I probably haven't said a good enough job yet of some of the grasses, though. I will say if you're planting ryegrass, um, which, you know, a lot of us weed scientists would rather that you didn't do that. But if you have ryegrass in the mix, uh, pyroxysulfone, which is in Zidua, and it's now in several other products as well, uh, that is going to probably almost certainly cause you stand reduction uh, every single time because it's actually labeled for ryegrass. Uh, so it's just a matter of how much dissipation occurs between your application and that. Um, all right, so th that's the soybean treatments. We did the same thing with corn, which I'll show you in a second, but um, just to kind of give you an idea for what this field's like, when you're doing this kind of research, there's lots of different things that can be reported. Uh, stand reduction and biomass reduction, to name just a few. Uh, just to kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, some slight stand reduction might not always translate uh, translate into uh, a, an actual biomass reduction. There's a lot of papers that have shown that. So, and, and to take that a step further, just because you see a little bit of yellowing or something on your cover crop, I'm not saying that the herbicide didn't cause that. It, it very well could have, but it doesn't necessarily mean, in many cases, it doesn't mean at all that you've got any kind of stand reduction or that you're going to get a biomass reduction. Uh, but here in this case, this is the most sensitive species. That's why I'm showing it. So I, I don't have a lot of pictures of all the other species because there's hardly anything to show. Uh, but, um, you know, this is true stand reduction with, the, for example, the flex star and prefix and pursuit treatments. And that's definitely going to translocate. Or <laughs> I'm too much uh, focused on weeds, I guess. Trans, it's definitely going to translate into a biomass reduction as well. But uh, a lot of other treatments there really didn't have any effect. So then we move to same treatments on our most common uh, grass that is planted. Uh, I think that's probably true across the entire Midwest, maybe the US really, uh, but uh, certainly true in Missouri, the most common cereal grass that gets planted cereal rye. And, you know, one of the reasons why we like cereal rye for so many different purposes uh, is that it's, it's able to uh, withstand uh, herbicide carryover. It's really no, we didn't record any uh, carryover in, in any of these treatments, really. So uh, from that standpoint, it's really good. Uh, but just to show you what I was talking about with the ryegrass, uh, this is what the non-treated control ryegrass one, one plot would look like. Um, so nothing had been sprayed there, but uh, three ounces of zidua uh, in the previous soybean crop post-emergence uh, was, uh, as you can see here, caused uh, quite a bit of stand reduction there. So um, that would be one to watch out for. We generally aren't spraying, and I will just clarify, we're usually not going to that high of an amount uh, post-emergence alone with Zidua, uh, but if you had it in the pre and the post, it's definitely possible uh, for that kind of amount to be out there. So uh, keeping on with the soybeans here, so 
the work we had done actually spurred uh, some more research later on that became a multi-state study. Uh, it's uh, this, this piece of data is across nine site years. Uh, I don't quite frankly even remember which states were involved. Uh, I know we had some pretty uh, drastic outliers. I think Purdue is one of our cooperators. So North going into Indiana and Arkansas, you know, south of us. So you had quite a bit of geography represented there. Uh, we tried to, basically in this study, we tried to hurt things. We tried to uh, tax uh, the cover crop species uh, and, uh, you know, basically try to really put it on them. So, you know, the gold was supplied 21 days after planting the black was these treatments applied uh, 42 days after planting, and uh, and uh, then the uh, uh, gray is is uh, just a just the worst case. You know, we, we got things like authority cyst, a pre-emergence followed by prefix followed by warrant, and. Uh, so maybe I simplify this too much with what we did here in this graph, because this is averaged across all the cover crop species and the uh, different sites. But, you know, in 2016, 2017, I guess we had a pretty favorable year across the entire geography, a lot of good moisture and no uh, real drought conditions or anything. And, what I'm trying to point out is just the fact that the highest amount of uh, reduction in ground cover uh, emergence that we saw was 8%. So it's pretty low. Uh, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Yes, I could dive into this data more and probably show you some things, but I don't know that it's really worth it uh, at this point for the short kind of talk that we're doing. And I think the previous kind of green, yellow, red graph just kind of showed everything that I would I would say anyway because some of the things that that stood up here was also about the flex star being more more injurious and all of that so just wanted to give you one more piece of data from us and this was across numerous states like I said I am going to come back to all of this here in just a second and give you some more up-to-date studies that have been published um so going back to our, our first uh, first study uh, that we ever did, which was those three years, 2013 to 2015, again, continuing with the uh, green, yellow, red kind of stoplight thing. These are all the corn treatments that we looked at in, uh, in a, you know, we sprayed these in a previous corn crop and then we planted all these different cover crops and looked to see what happened. And so again, uh, some of the things that we've seen that uh, would stand out would be again, like Zidua on ryegrass uh, and some of the bleaching herbicides. Uh, now, one thing that I guess I've seen a little more of uh, since uh, we did this early study is that um, I've seen a little more problem with mesotrione, Callisto, and when we did this work, um, we didn't really have a whole lot of kind of red flags there. Uh, you could see there's only like two species that caused a reduction in one out of three years. Uh, but I think as we maybe uh, since this time, you know, this was a while back, since this time, we're really loading up a lot of our acres with more and more mesotrion or loudus or impact. And uh, those, all three of them are uh, becoming more of a concern. So my watch out would be uh, in corn, it would be later, uh, later applications of the HVPD herbicides. And uh, yes, that would include impact, but I would, I would have to throw some Callisto in that list as well, based on some observations over the past couple of years. Uh, not going to happen every time, uh, but you know, it's just in in the dry years we've been having past two years, definitely possible. 
So here's just some pictures of this. And one thing I will say is definitely with the uh, group 27s, the HPPDDs, herbicides, uh, you you can get the bleaching and the bleaching is transient and it goes away and uh, doesn't really cause any biomass reduction, but there are times when you can get the actual stand and biomass reduction as well. So uh, just trying to make all this sense out of all of these studies that we've done. This is just the conclusions from our work. Um, I've already said this, the, the rainfall and the moisture is the biggest impact on whether you get uh, actual injury or not. So that's that first point. Um, and so if, if we, this isn't just my opinion, we actually ran all our data and through some statistics. And, and so this is our, uh, if we wanted to just say, well, what's the, what's the least sensitive crop and what's the most sensitive, uh, tillage radish is definitely the greatest, you know, most likely to get injured, uh, that's followed by Austrian winter pea, followed by crimson clover. And uh, actually crimson clover and ryegrass are equal, followed by winter wheat and winter oats. They're also equal. And uh, no big surprise really to me, or if you are in this area at all, and if you work in this area, hairy vetch and cereal rye, uh, two of the most uh, strongest, if you will. Uh, they, uh, they are not gonna be influenced too much or too often by the herbicides that we're spraying. Uh, we did the same thing with the actual ingredients, um, the active ingredients. So for soybean, uh, famisofen, number one, pyroxysulfa, number two, acetochlor. I didn't mention that much, but we can have some problems there on some of, uh, some of the grass species and also some of those smaller seeded uh, broadleafs. <laughs> Uh, and then the corn, uh, topramazone, mesotrion, so those HPPDs. Uh, should have mentioned this more. I don't think I pointed it out on the slide, but I, I should have. Uh, you know, with where we're going with corn herbicides lately, there seems to be more out there with clopyrrolid in it, and we're spraying more with clopyrrolid. Uh, and uh, so with our legumes in particular, we can have some problems there. Uh, should have pointed that out. Uh, and then again, the pyroxysulfone on some of the grasses and all of that. But like I said, I'm, I'm pretty old and uh, I've been doing this a while. And so I just the other day, because I knew I was going to have this session, I, I went into our weed science literature and I said, well, what's been published on this issue since then, uh, since my study? So uh, I've got two examples for you. Uh, I know there's a lot of words on the screen here, but um, I'm just gonna walk you through it. So this is a paper published in uh, out of Virginia Tech. Uh, they, they did the, their objective was the same as ours to look at uh, carryover to cover crops. Uh, and so I have a couple of quotes right out of their abstract. I don't know how much y'all read, you know, scientific journals. I'm guessing not as much. Maybe so. What I would say is, if you if you ever do, you know, you can jump right to the abstract and get most of the information. That's the that's the purpose of the abstract. And so they found uh, they looked at a lot of different treatments and and uh, I think thirty different herbicides. Uh, and so one of the biggest things that I thought was good that I wanted to point out out of their abstract is they basically say, you know, just because you can see visible injury doesn't mean there's gonna be uh, biomass reduction. So that's important to understand. Uh, and I totally agree with that. Uh, second thing is they didn't see any more than 20% injury from any herbicide. Uh, another thing, again, this is very consistent with us, lamisofen, greatest injury forage radish. Uh, I, I did not look at rapeseed in my work because um, it's just not done much here. Any that I know of or very rarely. Uh, they found that uh, balance or isoxaflutol was uh, pretty hard on that. 
And their final conclusion was that uh, uh, basically what what I'd said it is, you know, for the most part, we're pretty good here unless we have a dry, dry year that accentuates things. And, uh, you know, they looked at a lot of different herbicides and very few of them are really going to cause problems in the in the in the cover crop that's planted. So that was out of Virginia Tech. Uh, the last thing I have here for you is just uh, some work out of Arkansas. Uh, did a their objectives were the same. Uh, they did their experiments a little bit different than us. Uh, um, basically, they had a sensitivity experiment, which is they uh, applied one sixteenth of the rate of the herbicide as soon as the cover crops were planted, which is, uh, you know, some might might like say that's not really relevant, but basically they're trying to simulate uh, what uh, a level in the soil would do. So it's just one way of doing this work. And so um, they found a little bit more by doing it this way. I think they, they found more injury from some herbicides than what we had seen. Uh, so you can just take it however you want to take it. But in that sensitivity experiment, they definitely saw fomisifen they also saw atrazine, which we haven't had much problem with, metribuzin and sulfentrazone on some of the legumes, uh, crimson clover, vetch, and pea. Uh, but they point out that that uh, reduced biomass still didn't occur except for, for atrazine. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, as far as the grasses, uh, they were not affected by the soil by herbicides. Barley uh, was the only one that showed a biomass reduction. Again, doing it this way, which was planting the cover crop in the fall and spraying a 1 16th rate on the day of planting right, right over it. Um, so again, they had a different study, uh, which they called the carryover study, which would be more similar to what we did. Uh, which is, you know, actually having the previous cover crop there and taking it all the way through. Uh, but they applied a 2x rate of the herbicides in their, in their carryover study. And uh, even, even when doing that, they saw uh, very uh, few effects, even when applying a 2x rate. So, uh, so that's pretty much what information is out there. Uh, it's pretty short. Uh, I'm okay with short. Uh, I don't know what our timeline is, but you know, there's there's not much else to say on this topic. Uh, I think the keeping in mind the the red flags of what you know herbicides could cause injury, what kind of timeline, certainly the later applications, and then what kind of year you're having. Those are that's what I tell my farmers. Those are the three main things that you need to be looking for, but we're kind of blessed that we don't have too much of an issue with that, uh, with this issue in corn and soybean. If you move into cotton and rice and all of those kinds of things, the, there's a whole lot more that, that uh, causes problems. So with that, uh, I'm gonna try to stop sharing my computer is looking all kind of weird every time I do something in zoom but uh, um, with that I'll be glad to take any questions if there are any great thank you Kevin uh, Karen does have a question um, in the chat she says is this study ongoing or is it over um, if it's finished what is your next study uh, so yeah so our work is pretty much done uh, you know there there's different weed scientists in different parts of the country that have done their own studies and that's what I tried to show there um, um, that a uh, couple of different states but um, I don't unless we have some new herbicides that I'm concerned about or a new cropping practice that I'm concerned about I don't have any plans to do anything new right now with this issue or for that matter some kind of new cover crop for example 
but you know, uh, unless something new comes along, I, I feel like we've got pretty good data. But uh, yeah, if you're in a particular part of country that you have some particular herbicide that I have not covered, or uh, maybe like I said, some new cover crop. I'm, I know there's there's some talk about this thing called cover crest in Missouri. We've never looked at that. I have no idea what um, how sensitive that is. I'm guessing it's probably pretty sensitive. Uh, but so things like that, when they come along, we definitely will look at. But no, I don't. I don't have any uh, plans unless there's some kind of major need. Um, Kevin, I do have a question. Um, so I guess as far as looking at, uh, I guess, the effects on the following cover crop, how far out did you take that, um, I guess, injury monitoring? So did you just look at the following cover crop or did you look even two or three years out on some of these fields? No, we didn't look that far. We would we would look into the next spring and uh, that's pretty standard to see what kind of biomass is there the next spring. Um uh, but uh, that's that's pretty much when the study ended. It's kind of when the cover crop was getting mature in the spring and all of that. Um, you know, it, it would be extremely rare or also very concerning if we had persistence all the way for a whole nother year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat. I do have one more question written down. Um, so it looked, it's, it kind of sounded like um, some of those herbicides to watch out for are kind of those group 14, 15, and 27s with some exceptions in there. Um, did you happen to look at some, some of those common, um, I guess, bean post herbicides like Enlist and Liberty and I guess how those acted on the following covers? Uh, yeah, we haven't because they weren't a thing. Uh at the time. Um, but I mean, based on what we think we know, at least about, uh, those products, uh, you know, for the most part, I'm not too concerned, but that's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good point. Most of our soybeans right now are either a dicamba based treatment or a two, four D based treatment. And there's probably more work that could be done on, whether there's persistence there enough to cause injury to our legumes, those would be the ones I would be watching out for. Uh, I haven't seen it or gotten any calls about it or any concerns from our growers. And we, we have about a million acres of uh, cover crops grown in this state, but that doesn't mean it's not a, a potential problem and shouldn't be looked at it. It could be something that's looked at, uh, because clopyrrolid, like I said, is one that can cause injury to some, some legumes. So uh, it is it is possible. But 2,4-D and dicamba are, for the most part, going to not persist very long. Uh, that, that's what we think we know about them in the soil. And I wouldn't expect a whole lot of problems there, but you never know. Great. Thank you. Um, Janet has a question in the chat. Let's see here. Um, she asked, can we get a copy of this presentation? Um, I'll leave that up to Kevin. This meeting is recorded um, and the plan is to pass this around or uh, the recorded um, meeting around to the attendees. Yeah, uh, no problem at all. Uh, I, I will just say, if you want something quick, uh, you can go to our website right now and click on the slideshows tab and everything is is there exactly there's a there'll be a slideshow about cover crops and carryover or something like that but anyway the only thing that i added was the the two slides that are that are new that are from uh two other states of data but i'm i'm glad to share what i shared today in in some way if you just tell me i can guess i guess that's in it send a PDF to you through uh, email Brent if it'll go. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I can send that over to, uh, to Janet, if you don't mind. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Kevin? I don't see anything else in the chat currently. Oh, hey, Brian. Yeah. Hey, I, I have a quick question. Hey, Kevin. Uh, 
can you just make a quick summarize actually how the moisture uh, really uh, play in the role in terms of the, you know, the residue impact on the cow crops, you know, too dry, too wet, so moisture. Thank you. Yeah, so it's really, it's more about, uh, well, I don't know if it's more, but uh, so herbicides break down in the soil chemically and microbially. Uh, moisture influences the microbial populations and that I'm not a soil chemist expert when it comes to herbicides. We have very few of those kinds of people in the weed world. Uh, but my guess is it's more about the microbial populations than it is about uh, chemical hydrolysis and anything like that in the soil. Uh, but both, both things can play a role. It just depends on the herbicide. Most of these herbicides are broken down uh, microbially and uh, uh, anything that influences that population, which is drought type things, influences our ability to break them down. Also, I think we under, uh, I don't know, estimate or I don't know what the right word is, but we, we don't give enough credit to uh, the crop that you just sprayed it on is also breaking that herbicide down. And if you are spraying it in the dry conditions and all of that, that is going to happen to much less of a degree. And so kind of all those things kind of mesh together to influence it. Um, but yeah, that, that's in a nutshell, the best I can explain what's going on there.